Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and um, thank you for having me to tell you some stories um, about searching for plants. So, um, thanks for that kind of introduction. My, my name's um, Stuart McPherson, and um, I'm 30 years old, and this is a brief 40, 50, something like that, minute talk um, about some of the stories um, about basically my travels over the last 10 years uh, searching for rare plants. Um, just, to be clear, uh, just to be a bit clear on the, at the start, I'm not actually a, a botanist, um, I'm a naturalist. I love all animals and plants um, equally. However, um, I grew up absolutely fascinated um, with, ex with natural history and with explorers um, in particular. I'm not sure whether um, it, it's fate or, or whatever, but the irony of standing here in one of the greatest institutions in the world with regards to botany and horticulture, it's a real privilege to, to be with the R RHS today. And of course, this is <laughs> central to plant exploration and, and um, plant hunting for, for many of the last centuries. So um, I grew up basically reading the accounts of great explorers and great plant hunters um, for, for basically all my life, um, while my friends were, were thinking I'm very strange, and while they were playing football and stuff, I, I was reading the accounts of these early and great explorers. And many of them, of course, were RHS, Royal Horticultural Society and Kew um, explorers and plant hunters, and um, also from the great Victorian nurseries. Um, so my, my background has always been fascinated with natural history and um, this extraordinary heritage. And I don't know whether everyone in, in the UK really appreciates how amazing this heritage of our country really is. There's barely a, a country in the world that has this extraordinary heritage of natural history and plant hunting, um, which stretches back not just into the recent past, but, but over a thousand years or more, um, which, is, which is amazing. So for me, the Natural History Museum and the RHS and Q were, were almost sort of religious experiences. I'd go once a year um, into these great temples of natural history and, um, and be absolutely in awe of these amazing uh, accomplishments over hundreds of years of, of these naturalists and explorers that slowly tried to piece together this picture of the natural world. Um, and that's, of course, a process that's continuing absolutely to this day. Um, my earliest memories were, were Attenborough, David Attenborough, and I, of course, dreamt of always being a natural history um, presenter. And so um, I, it occurred to me very early on that right now is the last chapter of real exploration my generation is, is really going to be the last one where you can still go to places where no one has ever been before or, or see tribes, genuine tribes that, that, that aren't for tourists, um, that, that you can really still make these botanical discoveries and exploration um, before modernity washes across the world and everything, everything changes. So for that reason, um, that was the driving force um, for me to get into this area. And, um, and as I say, natural history, it, it, I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> I, I was born, this is the reason why I'm on this planet, this is the reason why I, I'm existing. And so for me, it wasn't really an option of doing anything else. I had to do this. And there was always this, someone told me once that there was this story about one day you'll be on your deathbed and, and wonder what you've done with your life. And so for me, it was always to set out to be a naturalist. But of course, becoming a naturalist or a plant hunter isn't actually easy. There's no set path, there's no exam, there's no qualification. There's nothing that you can do to become one, except just getting out there and exploring. So, um, so I had to find a start. I always loved carnivorous plants, um, plants that catch and kill animals. Ever since I was a kid, I grew them, um, literally as long as I can remember. And um, I remember running through the heathlands while we were on cross-country at my school and finding sundews, drosera, little sticky red sundews, and going nuts about these incredible carnivorous plants. And everyone else going, oh my god, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so I, I've always loved carnivorous plants. Um, and I guess in my late teens, I guess, yeah, 15 years ago or so, um, it kind of occurred to me, I mean, there's over 650 species all over the globe um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds had never properly been studied, never been photographed, never been, in some cases, even seen since they were discovered 100, 200 years ago. 
and many, many, many were, own, uh, were known only from illustrations or specimens that were collected in some cases 100 years ago or more. Um, for example, I mean, this is one pitcher plant, um, which is known still today only from this particular specimen at Kew. And as you can see, no one's even known the pitchers. So all they know is the, the leaves, the lamina. Um, so, um, so it occurred to me a few years ago that these plants that are grown around the world by thousands of horticulturalists um, and some of the most extraordinary plants in the world, and they truly are extraordinary, um, I thought this would be a good place to start, to try and, to try and, um, try and sink into, into natural history. A, because I absolutely, genuinely loved them ever since I was a kid, and B, because it was a clear niche that no one had, had really, really focused on. Um, so I, I set out about 15 years ago to set out to start doing a series of 30 books looking at each of these different groups of carnivorous plants in their habitats kind of for the, for the first time. Um, the, I, to do that project, I had to climb about 200 mountains all across the world, which would, of course, involve years of, of travel. Um, so basically, while I was at university, I was very lucky to get a scholarship to go to America and uh, wrote two books while I was at uni. Um, I, I got a scholarship and used part of that scholarship to, to travel down to Venezuela, which are some of the stories that I'm about to tell you. And, um, and basically wrote up two of these books while I was at uni, got those actually published with a publisher in America. Um, then on graduating, I was very fortunate to get a few grants to continue this, including some from the RHS, which those of you who are interested in this area, you really, really, really should look into the RHS. It's an amazing institution that supports a whole range of, um, of, of different research projects like this, um, and, and not academic projects for the individual. So you can literally be, like, like I was, not connected with any university, just an individual, and they supported that, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and, um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm in the RHS. <laughs> <laughs> it truly is an amazing um, opportunity. Um, and there are many others, like the Merlin St Trust and the Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust, that you should also look into. But that was a wonderful kickstart of this whole, this whole uh, sequence that I'm about to relay. So anyway, so then I graduated about eight years ago, took out a loan and set up a company called Redfern, and started writing and exploring, and that's basically what I've been doing for, for the last, well, roughly decade or so. So this lecture isn't actually about plants per se, um, although I hope to show you the exquisite beauty of, of some of the plants that I've been very fortunate to study and observe. Um, it's actually more about discovery and exploration. Um, and I, of course, I can only relay a few select stories. I, I'd love to tell you literally hundreds of expedition stories, but I can't uh, in, in today's time. I can only tell you a few. So this is a few stories about searching for plants and animals in some of the last unexplored corners of the world. Um, it basically falls into four parts, the lost worlds of Venezuela, Southeast Asia, um, some of the remaining wilds of North America, and some other areas, Africa, Australia, and, and uh, South, South Africa, and, and America, and, and so forth. Um, so anyway, so going to the first section of the talk. So, um, Basically, while I was at university, I started going to, to Venezuela quite a bit. Um, this area here is called the Guiana Highlands, um, this massive uplifted shield of rock which is home to these, these vast, gigantic plateaus called the Tepuis, or Tepuis, depending upon how you want to pronounce them. They're, um, they're, they're very complicated how they're formed. They're not actually an up uplifted block of rock, which is what they might look like. Actually, they represent the original surface of the land, and it's the rock in between the plateaus that's been eroded and denuded and washed away. So it's kind of like pebbles on a beach. If you throw a load of pebbles on sand and it rains, the, the water will wash away the sediment in between those pebbles. And as a consequence, you'll be left with, mass with uh, small remnants of that original surface of the sand. Anyway, across this area, across the Guiana Highlands, there's about 100 or so of these vast plateaus. And um, these are special for many, many reasons. They're, um, they're among the least explored corners of our world, mainly because they're surrounded by massive vertical cliffs up to 1,000 metres tall. Um, the summits themselves, which stand about 2,000 or 3,000 metres above sea level, um, that's because the, the lowlands, or the lower lands, rather, because it's a relative term, stands at 1,000 or 2,000 metres. 
So that's already high, but the summits themselves stand about 1,000 metres or so higher. Um, they're isolated, obviously, on all sides by these huge cliffs. And as a consequence, and because they're in such a remote, um, relatively uh, difficult region to reach and explore, many of them were only even discovered in the 1950s, as recently as that. Um, and of course, many of them were only reached and explored for the first time as recently as the 70s and 80s, or even, in some cases, even more recently than that, primarily because you just can't climb them. There's only about four of the hundred that, that you can easily climb. The others you can only get to by helicopter. So um, because of this, this massive physical and ecological isolation, because they're isolated physically, as in there's a barrier of a thousand metres, but also ecologically in the respect that the plants and animals on the top living a thousand metres above the lowlands, these plants and animals on the top are, are adapted to cold ecosystems, cold, wet um, systems, whereas in the lowlands it's hot, tropical and moist. So it's like trying to take plants from England and throw them into the rainforests of, um, of Brazil or, or vice versa. They just don't survive. Um, so for those ecological and physical reasons, they're very, very, very isolated. Anyway, some of you might know that this place is the, um, the location of the inspiration behind the, the story The Lost World by the great author Arthur Conan Doyle. Arthur Conan Doyle um, wrote this fictional work about a lost plateau in the middle of the South, um, South American rainforest, it, which was ascended by way of a pinnacle that people climbed up, cut down a tree and bridged and reached the lost world. And on the summit of that lost world, they found a land of dinosaurs. Well, um, well the reality is that these places have been isolated for tens of millions of years. They're not home, of course, to dinosaurs. However, they are home to one of the greatest concentrations of ancient living fossils found anywhere in the world. Um, they, um, many, many, many of the species are totally unchanged through time. Um, that includes the ferns, many of the arthropods, and even some, invertebra uh, some vertebrates, like many of the toads. This is one called Orofrinella, which is exactly the same as, as fossils, um, or very, very similar, rather, to fossils from West Africa and nothing else in South America. So they've basically been um, preserved and frozen through time. The landscapes on the top of some of these giant plateaus also has hindered their exploration because they're some of the most bizarre and difficult to cross landscapes in the world, covered by giant towering um, labyrinths of stone pinnacles, uh, which are carved into weird and bizarre, fantastic shapes by the wind and the water, which in some cases form mazes, really bizarre mazes of, uh, of these towers. And um, as you can see, <laughs> some of them are actually massive. This one in particular is said to look like a, um, a flying uh, turtle. Um, it's not quite at the right angle. From a different angle, it's a little bit better, but maybe you can see that um, with this, this friend of mine up on the summit of it. Um, anyway, they're very difficult to explore because not only is this, there is this labyrinth of stone columns and rock towers, but actually the summits of these plateaus also are crisscrossed with ravines so that it's difficult to get from point A to point B, not just because there's a maze in, the front, in front of you, but actually because you've got to zigzag along these huge ravines and you physically can't cross them. So, and also, just as a side point, just because it's, it's quite amazing, they're home to some of the most bizarre and weird landscapes on Earth. For example, valleys. This white here isn't sand. All of this white is pure quartz. Um, so big chunks of it that look like bizarre flowers. And um, all of these, uh, these quartz crystals, um, and even some of the plants, like this sundew here, is growing amongst these crystals. Mm -hmm. And just as amazingly, in the lowlands, there is this, which is the Jasper Creek, a waterfall that flows over a blood-red gemstone called Jasper. And whereas this stuff is used to make um, jewelry and rings and earrings and so forth, here, actually, the entire waterfall flows over a solid bedrock of pure Jasper. So anyway, that's a bit of a side point. And, and of course, the, the tallest waterfalls in the world. This place is so amazing. It kind of endless, um, incredible wonders of nature. Um, anyway, it's one of the wettest places in the world. And that, that has a big implication for the wildlife, particularly the plant life that occurs there. Because rain falls almost continuously up on the summits of these plateaus, it washes away all the nutrients and all the sediments off the top. So they form the, the tallest waterfalls on, on, in the world. Um, Angel Falls, which is the tallest waterfall on Earth, which is nearly a thousand metres tall, falls off one of these plateaus. 
Um, but honestly, there's hundreds, thousands of waterfalls that are of a similar height, and, um, and they're all just gigantic and spectacular. But the, the, the meaning of this, though, is that it's a bare, relatively bare rock surface on the top. All the nutrients, all the sediments are forever lost over the surface of these plateaus and washed down into the, um, into the, down into the rainforest below. And what that means, of course, is the summits themselves are impoverished. They're so-called rain deserts, where it's actually the rain, the amount of water that cripples life here. It drives plants to extremes. And this is very important because, because there's such an extreme environment, there's no one species that proclaims dominance. And as a consequence, all the different plants that live up here have to find weird and unusual ways to survive. Some of them grow directly on bare rock. This is a bromeliad called Brachinia tetii, um, which in this case grows completely on bare rock. You could just pick it up. There's nothing under it. Um, others, like these orchids, likewise grow as lithophytes on rock. And ironically, many of them flower, many of the species with the most incredible and the most beautiful flowers flower in the most barren and dramatic of places because there's so few pollinators in those dramatic and barren areas that they have to produce spectacular flowers in order to attract those few pollinators that are there. So you get this extraordinary paradox of having black, bizarre landscapes of rock with the most exquisite and most beautiful orchids in those barren areas. Anyway, um, these barren habitats are also important because they drive unusual adaptations, and particularly carnivorous plants, which, as I said earlier, was what I set out to, uh, to document. Um, they, they're actually some of this, these plateaus are some of the greatest concentrations of carnivorous plants found anywhere in the world. Um, I was very fortunate to helicopter to about 30 of these plateaus. Each one, it's not really true to say no one has ever stepped foot on. You, you can't really say that. But what you can say is that no one has ever really thoroughly explored the wildlife on many of these plateaus. And many of them, still today, no one has ever done systematic surveys. And still today, no one really knows what's there. Um, so this is one of the few places that you can blunder into new species. And through this talk, um, <laughs> I hope to try and show you how you can find new species in different ways. And the first one, which is, of course, the original way, um, is just to literally go to a place that's unexplored and blunder into them. And, um, <laughs> and that was um, my, my case for many of these new species on these plateaus. This plant here, for example, was, call, uh, was, was not, not called anything at the time. It was unknown. Um, I, I was on a plateau, um, a really remote mountain, and um, we'd had a long day climbing and exploring and trying to reach lots of niche habitats. And we're just walking back to the camp, a bit despondent, having not really found anything of any interest. And it's so funny, it's often the way you can, not when you're looking for things, is when you find them. And we were just passing through um, a forest made of Benicia trees, these little beautiful, almost bonsai-like trees called Benicia raimie. And um, we opened into a clearing, about actually pretty much the size of this room. Actually, this is pretty much exactly it. And in this tiny little glade, in this tiny little clearing of these weird, mossy, uh, montane, cloud forest bonsai trees, there was a sunny opening. And just in that little area, there was this plant. The ground was absolutely carpeted with them. And um, there's, a, there's a few other species of sundews known from these plateaus. But it was instantly apparent, instantly obvious, um, that this plant was something completely new because it made flowers amongst the, um, amongst the leaves and none of the other species did that. And so just, we just literally just happened to blunder completely by chance into that exact spot where it grew. And um, we actually spent several days or I think even a couple of weeks looking at other parts on that mountain and found absolutely nowhere else where it grew. And we even helicoptered over the mountain to look for the same habitat and there was nowhere else where, where the habitat was the same. So it's probable, or, or possible, I should say, that the entire world population of that species is in an area the size of this room, and um, we just happened to stumble into it. And um, anyway, that particular plant produces these leaves lined with droplets of sticky glue. And like sundews, many sundews across the world, the leaves have the power of movement. Not all sundews, some, some don't move, but many of them do. And the bugs basically get stuck to the glue and the tentacles slowly come and, and incurl around the bug and uh, secrete digestive juices and, 
and digest it, and that's how it can survive in these barren environments. So like I say, there's, there was just one tiny little patch of this plant, and um, the interesting thing is, of course, there could be thousands and thousands and thousands of other niche habitats like that, little pockets of habitat uh, with other similar undiscovered unknown species. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's funny... Um, <laughs> Um, it's, no, don't worry. Um, it's funny um, how often some of the very first trips that you do, or some of the first things in life, in all sorts of walks of life, often it's the first things in a series that you do turn out to be the most important. And I've found that again and again and again with the expeditions that I've been doing. Just out of coincidence, the very first one I'll do in a particular area just turns out to be the most important. And such was the case um, with, with these lost worlds, with these plateaus. Um, I was very fortunate with two other friends to undertake an epic expedition by helicopters to one particularly remote group of mountains that you can truly say is, is basically, basically the remotest part, at least on land, um, on, on Earth. It's called the Neblina Range, and the entire range was only discovered in the 1950s. It's down here, and um, it, I don't even know how long it is. It must be 20 kilometers long or more. It's over 3,000 meters tall. It's massive. And it was only even sighted for the first time by Westerners um, for the first time in the 1950s. So that gives you a sense of how ridiculously remote this part of the world is. Mountains bigger than anything in England, um, not even being seen until, well, 60 years ago now. Anyway, we had to get from here down to there, but of course we couldn't cross the international border with Brazil. So it actually involved an eight-hour helicopter flight but of course, helicopters, these small helicopters can't go that distance. So we had to have lots of Cessna drops, um, putting barrels of fuel at strategic points along the way. And for the last bit, actually, there was nowhere where the Cessnas could land. So in the end, we actually had to have another helicopter just transport traveling the entire way, just to strategically put it in that location where it could fly barrels of, of fuel with the other helicopter that myself and two others were in, just to get to the location take the barrel out of the second helicopter, refuel the, the two helicopters to enable both of them to make the journey back. That's how remote it is, and so how difficult and expensive it is to get there. So on this particular trip, we had basically eight hours flying, well, it was over basically two or three days, but eight hours of flight time over nothing but pristine landscapes. And it's difficult, and what always gets me in these journeys, it's difficult to convey a sense of distance. We're used to just jumping on a plane and flying half around the world in a few hours and not thinking of it. But this, these vast distances are very hard for us to comprehend today. And certainly was the case here. How ridiculously far, um, how hundreds and hundreds of kilometers over this incredibly difficult terrain. Um, but anyway, after these, this long journey, we, um, we finally reached this extraordinary lost world. And along the way, I just want to quickly make a few side points. Um, we, we had to resupply near several um, Yanomami villages, um, which was a real privilege and an honor to go to. Um, this part of northern Brazil and southern Venezuela is truly one of the last parts of South America where there really are these last um, tribes that live traditional lifestyles that, that basically are un, unimpacted by modernity. And the Yanomamis, these, this particular group, they still build these um, Chapano um, circular buildings of, of huts and, and they have more communal and, and, um, and social uses and they live in other huts in the surrounding area as well. But anyway, um, we were very lucky for a few days and a few nights while the helicopters were refueling to get a glimpse into this extraordinary vanishing world um, and, and see some of the last glimpses of these incredible Yanomami cultures. The, the Yanomamis in particular are, are cited as the, the best example of a pre-Columbian society but at the same time, I don't want to romanticize it too much. In a sense, it is also a paradise lost. There absolutely is still signs of change and creeping change. Miners fly to these areas and, and corrupt um, these communities with, with many different ills, including alcohol and so forth. And, um, and also, the romantic idea of the noble savage is very much a, a romanticized European one anyway. Um, the reality is that it's a hard life. It's a difficult life. It's a life played with disease and starvation and hunger. So, um, so at the same time, it, it's, it, I don't want to romanticize it too much because 
I think that's a, 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 mis, a, a misdeed in, in many respects. But regardless, um, it was incredible to see these extraordinary, unique cultures and um, special places on the way to this extraordinary lost world, which truly is the end of the world. So we landed on these bizarre mountains full of landscapes dominated by brachinia, by these carnivorous bromeliads, um, these weird golden landscapes, which as far as I know are totally unique in the world, of these yeah, metre-tall bromeliads um, with golden leaves. And we spent the, about a week or so searching for a few key species that had never been seen since they'd been first found in the 50s when this, ex this original exhibition went there. One of them um, was, was um, a particular uh, quest for a friend of mine, one of the three, that, one of the two others that came with me, Fernando. And um, he, he absolutely had his heart set on finding this spectacular sundew called, called um, Drosera meristicaulis. It forms these bizarre towers of its dead leaves, or actually rather stipules. And um, again, no one had seen it since it was found. And we, we were very fortunate to discover it, or rediscover it rather. And it was very interesting because only by going back to these places and finding these lost species can you really start to understand them. And since then, it's been found to be basically kind of like a, a missing link species because it occurs in South America, whereas all its, relics, all its relatives occur in Australia. And this is like an Aussie one. And this is the, um, the one in South America. And um, it's very key to understanding the genus and, and also as a paleo relic that it's been preserved there for millions and millions of years. In addition to that, we found three really special pitcher plants. Now, these weren't new species. Again, I, I'm trying to show you through this talk about how it's not just about going to remote places and discovering something new. It can also be about detective work or working out what other people have found, but they didn't really know what it was. And such was the case for these pitcher plants. Three pitcher plants had been found from this area. Um, they, they're not new species because, as I say, someone found them in the 50s. But no one really knew what they were. Many thought they were all the same thing. Um, of course, people who were only working from herbarium specimens, dried, preserved specimens. And no one really knew what these plants were. So when we got there, we immediately found across these ranges, we found three very different spectacular plants, one that grew up on towers um, of dead leaves with these beautiful pitchers with broad nectar spoons at the top, others that grew on the ground with big blood red veins, and others that grew much taller pitchers with um, blood red stripes with no hairs on the back. And um, it was really immediately clear that actually those early explorers had found not one species but multiple, and, um, and we, um, we, we since published them up and, um, and, and relegated, um, <coughs> elevated them to three different species. Um, so again, it just shows that discovery isn't always something new in the field or in the future. It can also be looking to the past, and in the past through herbarium specimens, through past expeditions, through past explorers, and past observations. So plant hunting isn't just about going to remote places. It can actually be just as much about going into herbariums or museums and finding the discoveries of other expeditions from the past. Anyway, just as a side point, these um, plateaus were pretty amazing because they had simply some of the most extraordinary plants in the world and some of the least known plants in the world. And I just wanted to show you a couple just as a side um, out of interest. This one in particular is awesome because it's called Stegolepis hitchcockii, a very, very strange genus of plants. And on one side of the leaves only, it has a weird glossy um, shine to the leaves. And in that gloss, in that cuticle on the leaf, there's a bizarre electric blue iridescence. So this isn't a pigment. This isn't a color. It's an optical effect, like a CD. So if you look at a CD and shine it from different angles, you get different rainbow colors. Well, the same in this, the case of this leaf, but only one surface of it, and only blue. So really, really bizarre in that respect. Um, Likewise, there are other ferns. This is Elaphoglossum wadakii that grows under rocks and in caves and that likewise has this iridescent blue shine. And well, actually in different parts of the world, in Southeast Asia, you get others as well. This is a, um, a Selaginella. This is um, Selaginella wildoveri, I believe, which likewise has this extraordinary blue shine. And no one really knows why these plants do this. This is a Mepania. Like, no one knows why. It's not just for pollination because, of course, the ferns 
by their very nature don't don't flower. They, they don't attract pollinators. They don't flower, and it's not just because of um, UV, because some of them grow in dense shade, some of them grow in um, bright sunlight. People originally thought it was a reflective thing to prevent uh, harmful ultraviolet light, but it's, it's just not that simple. Anyway, um, one of the important things that I wanted to say is that, like, um, just because someone goes to an area doesn't mean that all of the new species are necessarily known. For example, honestly, I only really have expertise in carnivorous plants. I can, I can tell you if a plant's carnivorous or not, <laughs> but I can't necessarily, and, and if that's a new species, but I, I really don't have any idea about other genera, for example, ferns, or other families rather, or ferns or orchids and so forth. I just don't have that knowledge. So, um, for ex so one of the points that I really wanted to emphasize is that, that on these expeditions, and expeditions in general, it's not as simple as the fact of just saying, oh, someone's gone to that place, therefore all new species must be discovered. That's totally not how it works. Um, it, that's just not how it works at all. I, I go to a place and can tell you if I see any kind of plants, whether they're new species, but I don't know whether the other genera are or not. So it, it leaves the door open for future expeditions and um, future explorers. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly mention these plateaus, these tepuis or tepuis, they're basically like, they've often been described as islands above the clouds or islands in time. And in a sense, they really are like islands. Um, they're very much like the Galapagos. Each one is a little pocket of isolated habitat with its own different, unique world on it. And just like the Galapagos Islands, um, for my pitcher plants, my carnivorous plants, there's, there's carnivorous plants basically on all of them. And often what you see is that on each individual mountain, even though the same genus will be present, there'll be different species on each, in each individual mountain, just like the Galapagos finches, whereby the plants have adapted in unique ways to the unique conditions of each individual mountain. And they're also some of the places with the greatest concentrations of unique life, again, much like islands, um, with about 35% of the wildlife on each individual plateau occurring near us in the world, and about 70% of that summit environment occurring near us in the world. So in my picture plants, it was very, very interesting going to about 30 of these plateaus and looking at the different species occurring on each individual one. Um, and basically, like I say, there's a different species on each plateau um, adapting to different habitats. On mountains where the conditions would be very harsh, they generally grow very small and form cushions, whereas others that would be very vegetated would grow much taller and produce traps that, that, that grow through the vegetation and, and in some cases can be, you know, 40, 50 centimetres tall. So um, I was involved, I was very lucky to be involved with another, I think, four or so new species from those plateaus. And um, my colleagues, particularly from Germany, some really wonderful botanists, discovered many, many, many more, um, mainly before I was going there. And it just goes to show how little we knew about this particular group. Ten years ago, there was five species. Now there's like 25. So you can see how, in just in a few years, how the, the genus has well, increased <coughs> five times the number of species that we know it to, to contain. Anyway, these are a couple of the ones that that I was very fortunate to, um, to be involved in, in discovering and naming. Anyway, I wrote those up, those, plata those plants up and, um, and the natural history of those areas up as a, as a few books. Then focused on Southeast Asia, um, looking at these guys. These are Nepenthes, the tropical pitcher plants. Um, they're some of the most amazing plants in the world. Um, but yet there had never been a monograph on the entire genus. No one had ever, ever looked at, well, in certainly recent times, back before there, there had been a few works, but at that time there had only been a, a couple of species known. Today there's about 120, 130 approximately, and no one had ever looked at all of them at all in any, in any way. So, um, so I had to climb about 150 mountains across the area where the Nepenthes grew, and it, I worked out it, it took about four years to do them systematically, one after another, and uh, to go and basically try and refine these plants and work out what they're like in the world and how they're related and they're, just document them in an old school natural history way. And again, it's funny how um, your first trips are often your most important. So as at the start of this long um, plan to, uh, to, to visit all these mountains, I... Um, I first of all, I did a, a, a volunteer gap year project to the Borneo, to, to a place called the Malia Basin. 
And inside one of those plants, I found the body of a, a small mouse. Oh, I, it's not actually a rat, a rat, a rat, a rat here. It wasn't, it was a small mouse in a really small species called Nepenthes hirsuta. And that really got me absolutely hooked on these plants. So um, I wanted to focus on, on the great epicenter, Borneo, which is where many species occur, but also on other areas. What often happens in botany is that certain areas get focused on and people go to those areas and explore really intensively, but forget areas nearby. And absolutely that was the case with, with these Nepenthes. Borneo basically and, and Sumatra basically are the great hotspots of biodiversity um, with other areas nearby with a few species. Well, basically very, 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 very few people had ever been up to this island here called Palawan. It's believed to have been connected to Borneo many times in the recent past with land bridges during, um, during uh, at times of lower sea level, during ice ages and, and glacial times. And, so, and also it's very close by to have dispersal by, by the wind and so forth with seeds and, and other vectors. And um, at the time, it was a very unstable island. It had been a very unstable island because of there had been a communist insurgency and a few uh, other, other, other civil issues. And so basically no one had really, particularly for Nepenthes, really gone there for the best part of 100 years to really study and search for the plants that occurred there. So I decided to make that a particular area that I was going to focus on. And um, there was one particular story about a mountain called Mount Victoria that, um, that had basically, I'll briefly recount the story. Um, so in 2007, when I got to Palawan, a few years earlier, a load of missionaries had climbed this mountain to re install up on the summit a repeater station up on the, on the top. They hadn't um, prepared very well. They literally just marched up the, um, the, the mountain, got to the summit, built their repeater station so they could contact with uh, missionary outposts throughout the island, but unfortunately couldn't find their way down. They ran out of food. They got lost on the summit. They spent a week up there. They nearly died of starvation and eventually had to get helicoptered up for something like $30,000 um, and rescued, which I guess their missionary um, uh, seniors probably weren't too pleased about. But um, anyway, when they were rescued, they, um, they reported stories of seeing weird plants up there and giant pitch plants up on the top. So at the time, only one species called Nepenthes mira, sorry, two species, Nepenthes mira and Nepenthes argentii, were known from this island. There were dozens of mountains across it, but only two species were known. So we decided to, to focus on this mountain and go and, and see what was up there and see if there was any truth to the story. So I went with two very good friends, Alistair Robinson and, and Volker Heinrich, and the three of us set off to march up to this extraordinary double-peaked mountain that was towering above the mists. Like all these expeditions, we start off uh, finding porters and getting supplies in the lowlands and basically just then working our way up, macheting a trail and, and seeing how far we can get up and um, cut our way through the jungle. This particular mountain had absolutely no trails after a certain point. It was totally wild. And um, the only way we could basically make progress without spending months hacking our way through the dense jungle was actually by the rivers. The rivers on these unexplored mountains are like highways, and um, you can get in them. Often you have to keep crossing, and such was the case here. I think we had to cross like 20 or 30 times. But, but slowly we followed the rivers until the rivers petered out. Then we got into mossy forest and started to make our way up. And um, as we went up, there were these bizarre plants, which probably, again, may well be new. I just, I just don't know enough about them. They may well be new species. Weird blue mushrooms and beautiful pink ferns. And um, unfortunately, as we were going up, one of the guides uh, macheted himself. Um, actually, on that particular, I heard lots of guides machete themselves, but on this particular case, he, um, he was trying to open a can of tuna with a um, three-foot uh, blade in the rain <laughs> at night. Um, and I'd already seen him trying to do this, and I could kind of see what was going to happen. So I gave him a, um, I said, look, come on, I'll do it. And I had a pen knife and opened it for him. But anyway, evidently he'd gone off and done, tried to do this again which isn't the best of ideas, and don't try that at home, it's just common sense. Um, but anyway, he did try it, and um, as sadly, he, the, the blade obviously slipped and very seriously cut his, his hand. And I absolutely was like, no, come on, let's just, let's just forget this whole mountain, let's just go and get you um, some medical treatment, because it was really serious, and I had, to, I had to had a medical kit and had to stitch him up a bit and sort him out. Anyway, he, he absolutely insisted that he wouldn't go. Even if we walked down, he was still going up at the top. 
think it was sort of a pride thing, more than anything, and insisted that he was going up to the summit of the mountain with or without us. So unfortunately, we had no, um, no, uh, no, no, no choice but to continue. But like I say, it wasn't... I absolutely wanted just to abandon the expedition and get him medical treatment, but that wasn't the case. Anyway, we finally got up to this ridge top, stepped out of the bamboo forest into this misty, strange, heath-like vegetation on the summit. And then suddenly, all around us, which is always the way you, re you find these things, you step into their habitat after days, weeks, who knows how long, in some cases months of travelling, that you suddenly hit that particular niche habitat. And in that niche, you find whatever it is that's growing on the mountain. And in this case, it was an extraordinary giant pitcher plant, which is here. <laughs> This thing produces leaves about this, this bit here are the leaves, um, which are up to, yeah, about a metre across. And at the end of each leaf, they form a long tendril. And at the end of that tendril are the traps, the organs that catch and kill animals. And in this case, there were giant pitchers about so big. And um, it was such a beautiful plant. Um, and it was clearly, it was immediately obvious it was a new species. And not only that, to boot, that there was another new species up there as well which is another sundew, which I could recognise immediately as new. Um, so we, we decided to, um, to, to we, we got permission to collect herbarium specimens, collected them and deposited them at the local herbarium, because it's important they stay in the, local, the same country. And uh, what, what was important about this plant is that it, it's basically one of the biggest of all of the carnivorous plants. It's like finding an elephant today in this plant, in this kind of plant world. It's, yeah, one of the biggest ones. Um, and out of absolute respect, because um, I've always loved him ever since as a kid, I wanted to name it after David Attenborough. So this is Nepenthes Attenborii. Um, um, I'm not sure if poor Sir David actually realised at the time, um, and we didn't really realise at the time, but it was later found on a later exhibition that many of them had trapped actually rodents and mice, and we filmed this. And um, this actually was a shrew that was found inside one of the pictures. Um, so, um, and this is a different species, but nevertheless with a rodent trapped inside the great pitchers. And it's very, very easy to imagine how they fall in. I should point out the plants, despite what people sensationalise, they didn't evolve to catch and kill rodents. That's not true. They evolved to catch and kill insects. However, under extreme circumstances, the very biggest um, are able to catch and trap and kill rodents, and in some cases other vertebrates. Um, just because those vertebrates are attracted to the same things that the insects are attracted to. So they didn't, there's no such thing as a rat-eating plant. However, um, it, in a sense, the plants, do, well, they do digest the, uh, the, anything that falls into them, like rodents, and, um, and they certainly derive benefit from them. But it, it really is an exaggeration to, uh, to say that they, they trap rats. But um, I say I, I named it after David Attenborough, after nothing but the truest and most sincere of respect. I didn't expect it to become really, 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 um, it was like a media, the media picked up on it and when it was published I had like two, 200 newspapers cover it and loads of interviews all around the world and I remember the Sun put this silly story in Rattenborough or something like that <laughs> and so poor, I felt very sorry because I genuinely didn't mean it. So I wrote to David, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean for this to happen. But he said, no, not at all. And he was, his words were that he was thrilled to the marrow um, that the plant was named after him. So um, he was very kind in letting us name it after him. Um, anyway, uh, after that trip, um, there was another mountain just across the valley. And a, the year later, I went back and found even a bigger plant. So it just goes to show you what is out there. Today, this is, would be like finding... Um, literally like an elephant, like it, it, it just, it's crazy that no one had even seen these things before. And as you can see here, it's so big, I could even put my whole hand in it. So it would have um, probably digested me if I'd given it half a chance. Um, you know, I named that one Palawanensis. And um, what was really interesting is that on every, pretty much every single peak going up the island that we climbed, there was a new species or a new variety or a, a new form or so forth along it. So it just goes to show that it was just one of those cases where no one had been up. But like I said, tried to say earlier, new species, finding new species, it's not just about blundering into them or going to the last remote places in the world. There can actually be a lot of detective work involved. And many people think botany is boring. Or well, perhaps not this audience, but, um, <laughs> but the general public often thinks botanists are, are boring. 
And um, that's always been something that I've tried to, um, to counter. And um, not just through exploration, but also through this detective work. And this is a good example. On this island of Palawan, there were only two species known at the time when we, when we went there. Um, one called Nepenthes diniana, which was collected in 1907. Um, it, the specimens had been destroyed in the Man Manila, Manila <laughs> herbarium uh, during World War II, which was unfortunately bombed and burnt. And um, anyway, um, no one had ever been back to find it. The original records were from a mountain called Mount Polga. And several teams had been back looking for it, and it failed. And um, anyway, we went back and first climbed a mountain called Salakot, which was not high enough, and there was nothing on the top of it. So we went back to the drawing board, looked at some maps, and noticed a mountain that fitted exactly the same altitude as the original 1907 report, except that it wasn't called Mount Polga. It was called uh, Thumb's Peak. And of course, um, Thumb in Spanish is Polga. <laughs> so, um, and in, uh, also importantly, that the original mountain was reported to be inside the grounds of a prison, and as was the case with this Mount uh, Thumb Peak, which also was in a prison called the Iwahig Prison. And after a couple of weeks, we got permission to go inside under the proviso that we would have to be guided by inmates. So this prison um, was a, a penal farm. It was basically an area where the prisoners absolutely must not leave, but they're allowed to grow their own food. However, if they leave those fields, they're shot. And there's guard posts and barbed wire and, and things like that. So they have liberty in the sense that they're in an area and are allowed to farm and grow animals and so forth. But it is still a, a, far, a prison in the sense that they absolutely will be shot if they leave the grounds. So um, anyway, we, um, we had this extraordinary uh, situation where we got in. We're actually fogged to start with. Someone decided it would be a great idea to, uh, to insecticide the entire thing. So um, we, first of all, were in this misty, strange prison, met our, um, our uh, uh, inmates who were going, very kindly going to guide us. And, um, and I, I always, I'd like to say that they were murderers. Um, I don't think they actually were. I think they were probably in there for some terrible deed. Um, but for the sake of this talk, let's say they were murderers. Um, so we were guided by these murderers. And um, what was very strange is as we were going up this peak, um, obviously as we were macheting through the vines, and I've never seen this anywhere else in the world, the vines bled blood red sap. So um, I thought it was sort of a bit of a warning. <laughs> Um, but as we were going up this mountain and macheting through um, all the vines, as you can see here, this weird blood-red sap was dripping all of us. And these strange morphothallus, these aroids, were growing um, along the trail as well. But this, particularly this blood-red sap was a bit of an omen. Anyway, we finally got to the summit, and there, of course, was the plant. It just goes to show that a bit of detective work and retracing those early expeditions, and you can find exactly what it was that, that those early explorers had originally seen. And the, prog, the guides at the top, well, you might ask, did they escape? No, they didn't. On the other side of this mountain was a vast wilderness which they basically would have no, no chance in surviving or escaping through, um, which is, I guess, the genius of this prison. It's right at the base of a massive range. And um, they, they, um, I think they enjoyed very much their few days away from the, um, from the prison compound, but they returned back very faithfully and, and, um, and, and good back to, uh, back to the grounds. But, of course... Whatever they were in the prison for, they of course had massive machetes. So I say that, that definitely did play on my mind a little bit as we were uh, going up. Anyway, over the, last, over the four years after those trips, I, I did the remaining 150 mountains. And just wanted to quickly show you the, just how amazingly intricate these carnivorous plants are. Not only the shape, but the fact they produce nectar, often extraordinary blades to trap prey. The insides are coated with wax to prevent the prey from escaping. In other genera, even they, well, these ones have compounds to make bugs sink in the fluid in which they contain very quickly. And in other genera, even they have narcotic compounds basically to make insects drunk or an anesthetic fluids to make them basically fall asleep and drown really quickly. And also extraordinary symbiotic relationships. This plant here looks like a toilet bowl. It's called Nepenthes lowii. In fact, named after a great and illustrious plant hunter called Sir Hugh Lowe, who is very much connected to to here, to the RHS. Anyway, um, um, it, it, they look like a toilet bowl, and in reality, they actually are a toilet bowl. This species has evolved a relationship with shrews and, and other birds. This is a true shrew <laughs> that lick um, nectar off the back, and then they, they're positioned precisely over the, uh, the opening of the trap, and, well, 
let's use a polite word, deposit waste products into the, uh, into the trap, and that's how the plant gets its nutrients. Um, anyway, so over the, the next few years, I wrote up a, a monograph of three volumes like, looking at all of these extraordinary um, nepenthes, and um, along the way was lucky to see some extra extraordinary other plants, um, like giant rafflesias that are like a metre wide, um, the extraordinary bat plant, Taka, that has these bizarre wings and, and incredible pollination systems, and these massive amorphophallus, these massive aroids that, that, well, this isn't the biggest species by any account, but even this one was sort of so big. And the earliest explorers actually thought they were pollinated by elephants. Um, they aren't. They're actually ironically pollinated by tiny sweat bees. But the original explorers, the earliest explorers, including Stanford Raffles, the fellow that's, that founded Singapore, actually um, thought that they were, <laughs> they were pollinated even by elephants. And it just goes to show what's out there, and I still don't really know what this is. Um, the world expert on uh, aroids, on these amorphophallus, thought this could even be a new genus. Uh, so not just a new species, but a whole new family, um, which, because it's, a, it's an aroid, but has um, a bizarre spathe that's curled around the spadex, um, as you can see here, which no, no, none of them, as far as I know, no, none of them have that. I still don't really know what it is. So that might even be not a new species, but an old g new genus. And g finding new, new genera today is very, very unusual. Um, anyway, also some incredible Paphiopedalum orchids and so forth as well. And last point on this Borneo, uh, Southeast Asia section, is basically some of the amazing tribes that had to visit and, and explore and go through, such as um, the Tonkonan um, tribes of, of, um, of Sulawesi and some of the Dani people of New Guinea and also it's not just about plants these expeditions these amazing windows into the past and like I say it's a vanishing it's a tragedy because the loss of culture is just as tragic as the loss of species and um, and it and it's it's tragically it's an inevitable thing there's nothing we can do you, you can't fence off people and say don't change it just doesn't work that way it's a creeping process of modernity that 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 you can't stop but it's one that we can lament just as much as the loss of, of species. Anyway, so across Southeast Asia, I was very lucky to find, I think, I think it was about 19 or so of these new um, pl carnivorous plants. Um, here's a few of them, um, and a few more. <laughs> um, basically, they're all are similar, but have different shapes and structures and traps. Um, and I wrote a series of field guides on them as well, like on each different region, and um, showcasing their beauty. Um, then went to focus on North America to continue the project. And also just one of the other points is that you don't actually have to go even to the most remote corners of Earth or even into the past or detective work to find new species. New species actually are even still being found here in Europe and certainly in North America. The North America in the USA is home to these, these spectacular pitcher plants, Saracenia. And um, simply no one had bothered to, uh, to, to look at them and describe them all. Um, they're some of the most famous and certainly the most beautiful plants in the USA, but um, 18 of them, 18 taxa, had never been, um, never been described. If you go into the Saracenia bogs, they're basically like a rainbow. Each species occurs in lots of different forms. It's the same structure, but different color variants. And for some species, such as this one, all the different color forms had been named 100 years ago or more whereas in exactly the same colour forms in different species had never been named. So, um, so it just goes to show, even in places where we, we've been botanically exploring, people have been botanically, exploring botanically very, for a very long time, even in areas like this, there's still species, or in this case varieties and forms, that no one had ever even bothered to name. And it was literally that simple, just they'd never been, been named. Um, so I set out to name, um, what was it, 18 I think or so, of these different colour forms. And like you say, as you can say, see here, they're not different species, they're just different varieties. So this is one species, you've got a green one here, a pure white one here, and so forth. So um, it's not just about exploring into the most remote corners. So I did a monograph of these different plants, and even though they're not discovered, I, I can't say that I discovered them, um, they're just being named, that's all. And of course, even on the Venus flytraps, no one had ever looked at the cultivars, so I did a, a couple of books looking at their beautiful cultivars um, and so forth. And then lastly, um, across South America, at parts of Africa, Asia and other parts, and Australia, 
um, looked at these spectacular sticky-leaved insect-eating plants, these plants that produce leaves with glistening droplets of glue that attract and trap insects that get stuck to them like flypapers. And in many cases, the leaves slowly curl around. And same with this. They'd never, never really been studied as a monograph. No one had ever looked at all of them. So I'm still writing up these ones here and these ones here at the moment and completing them and, um, and so forth. So I'm, I'm nearly finished through my, my objective. <coughs> There's a decade in, and um, I still have a few more to go. Um, just on the last notes, um, just wanted to say a couple of points. Um, yeah, the, the, the really important thing about plants, about new discoveries, is like I said at the start, just because someone goes to an area doesn't mean all of the new species have been found. You can't, no one can recognise everything, despite what many people will tell you. No one is an expert in everything, they're just not. Um, and certainly in my case, I can only recognise new species of carnivorous plants. I have no idea if orchids or ferns are new. So um, you need different experts to basically go to the same location to know if there's new plant, new species in each particular group. And equally, there's massive habitats, enormous habitats, that are still today totally inaccessible, like the cliffs of the Tepuis, which you just simply can't get to. And considering how localised some plant species can be, like that sandu I showed you at the start, which occurs in an area the size of this room, it really makes you wonder what else there could be. Like on these plateaus, these Tepuis, the ones that I mentioned at the start, no one has ever, ever, ever looked at the sides of the plateaus, which represents an area many times bigger than the summits. And there's vegetation, as you can see, all over them. So or, and on these talus slopes here. So who knows what's there? There's just huge wildernesses out there. It'll certainly be a long time until we've really discovered the amazing um, diversity of, of our world. Just on the very last point, the ending point, um, in case if it's of interest, in addition to, to these, these uh, studies on carnivorous plants, the last three years I've been trying to visit all of the UK overseas territories. So I'm trying to look at the plant life and the animal life of these extraordinary UK islands scattered all over the globe. Um, basically, the UK is totally unique as a country, and main, most Brits don't even realise this. But the UK is unique in the respect that we have 14 territories scattered all over seven seas that cover most latitudes and certainly every major uh, habitat type, every major ecotype, um, that are literally in every seven, all of the seven seas all across the globe. And no country in the world has, has a, an equivalent situation. And anyway, if you put them all together, they represent, represent an area seven times the size of the British Isles and have 20 times the biodiversity and some of the greatest wildlife spectacles on Earth. So in addition to concluding my work on carnivorous plants, I've been, over the last three years, undertaking a 70,000 kilometre journey to all of them, um, and from deserts to rainforests to Antarctic wildernesses and, and, and wastelands to tropical beaches and reefs. They've got literally the greatest diversity you could imagine of, of plants and animals. And there's 14 territories, but 21 locations, and we've basically done 20 of them. So we've only got one left to go. And, um, and then basically filming it as a, a documentary series. Um, so, um, so yeah, so in case you're interested, that's what I've also been doing at the moment. So my last point basically is that ours really is an extraordinary world. Um, maternity obviously detracts, often detracts from, from our inbuilt awe. Um, I really like this concept of awe. All kids are naturally inbuilt with a fascination of the natural world, whether it's like a spider's web, glistening in the sun, everyone, all human beings. Um, we're the, the wise ape, the knowing ape. That's what the Latin name of our species means. And we're all imbued with this extraordinary awe, which is just hypnotic. But we kind of lose that, especially in modernity, especially technology. And um, I don't know, one of the things that I always try and convey, especially to younger audiences, is how valuable that awe is. It's, um, it's the most precious thing. And, and that fascination, that never lose that childhood fascination with the world because, at least personally for me, that, that my travels have revealed just how amazing this world is and how we just completely take it for granted. Um, so, um, so thank you very, very, very much for listening. And um, I hope you enjoyed my talk. <laughs> thank you.
kindly agreed to answer any questions that you have. Of course. So um, if anybody has any questions, that you're really the, wine the wine's over there. Scotty, <laughs> 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 right. I'm quite interested on the, the naming convention. I think it's yeah. great that you put this to Attenborough, but I now have this vision of a group of naturalists, botanists, or whatever, come to a place such as uh, yeah. where you found that one, the guy in Highlands. Yeah. Is that is it fisticuffs at first all? Is it whoever grabs it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, the honest truth is that it's actually kind of bad practice to name it after people these days. Most, most professional naturalists and scientists and botanists and zoologists prefer that, that species are named either after the location or a description of the plant. The naming process works like this. Let's say um, I'm walking through a jungle and find a new species of cup. Um, at least for plants, it's a bit different for animals. But let's say, okay, maybe a cup's a bad example. Let's say it's a, a flower. Um, so let's say I've discovered a new species of flower. At least for plants, um, you have to collect a herbarium specimen. So you have to collect one of those plants, press it in paper, and dry it out. Um, the hardest thing actually is permits. These days, it's not like in the olden days with Victorian naturalists that could collect anything that they want in any countries. Today, it's very strictly um, controlled with rules, and, and rightly so, of course. It has to, in particular, um, in particular, it's important that those specimens remain in each country where they're found. Um, but anyway, the, the point being is that you find something new, like a new flower, you have to collect a specimen. You have to kill one, basically. There's no other way to do it. You have to kill a plant, um, press it, but then that becomes the species. So the concept of a species is basically just a description of a particular specimen. And it's whether that specimen is representative to whatever you're looking at, determines whether what you're looking at is that species or not. So you collect a specimen, submit it to a herbarium, for example, like Q, and then <coughs> all, all flowers that are exactly the same as this as the one that I collected are basically then that species. You have to write a description that corresponds to that, um, that specimen and publish it. And then once that description is published, then it's, it's a published species. So your question was actually about naming. Sorry, go off the track a little bit. Um, <laughs> so um, with regards to naming, I mean, it has to be Latinized and it has to uh, follow conventions of... Um, the, uh, the, the botanical code of nomenclature. Basically, it has to be like grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. And um, names, yeah, okay, let's say you're naming it after a location. Let's say you found it in London, you could call it Londonensis. The ending of ensis means from London. So, you know, that you could call it, yeah, Drosera Londonensis, or meaning from London, or you could call it London Eye, which means like of, you know, naming after London or whatever. So yeah, you can actually name it, you could name it anything. Um, for example, um, there are a few dung beetles found recently, and some rather cheeky entomologists named them after George Bush and uh, <laughs> Dick Cheney. So you, you couldn't actually <laughs> name it after anything you want to. Um, um, but obviously, you know, for, for, for the longer term, because these plants, these species, hopefully, will live on way beyond our lifetimes, maybe hopefully thousands of years, and survive into the distant future. So in, in 100 years, 1,000 years, people might not necessarily know who, who any, any people alive today are. So more and more so the convention is, is to actually name them describing the plants. But to answer your question, actually, yeah, it, you, you could, in theory, you could name it after anything. And um, botanists can be a little bit cheeky in that respect. Um, they, can, they can make jokes in the names or, or, you know, be a bit rude sometimes as well in some of the names as well. But, um, but anyway, um, you can name it after anything you want to. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Yes. Stuart, I wonder about the limits of permits. Presumably they, they vary around the world, but yes. are they general specific? Are you only allowed to take live plants as well yeah. as well, um, specimens? It, it depends what country, and I've always, always been very, very, very careful um, to, to adhere to all permits and regulations as much as possible. In some cases, you, you don't really ever know what's possible because of bureaucracy and, and corruption and, and, and so forth, but, but always tried the absolute hardest to do that. Um, for these collection permits, we've only ever applied for carnivorous plants. For much larger botanical exhibitions, I, I believe the case is that you can basically collect an, anything providing that it remains in the country, for some countries. Um, but for our purposes, we, we made it clear we're, we only know anything about carnivorous plants anyway. Um, so the friends that I always were going with, we'd always basically just focus on them. Um, and then, of course, deposit those specimens always at the local herbarium because it's, it's illegal to take those specimens out of the country. 
many countries, quite rightly so, don't want foreigners coming in, basically discovering something, then taking it back, and, um, and then they're not even knowing about it. Um, of course, for, for many different reasons, through time, of course, Europe in particular, you know, because of its role in the world and, um, and, and exploration and colonialization and so forth, there, people always make a joke that if you want to look at the uh, plants of, of America, you have to go to Kew. And if you have to want to look at the plants of Africa, you have to go to America or something like that. Um, point being that all of those plants that were discovered were found in, were, were now in different regions. So yeah, we, we absolutely always um, try and adhere to all permits and regulations. And most importantly, all of the specimens stay in, in those home countries. Um, and it can be a bit depressing. The reality is that's not actually necessarily a, a, a good thing if you look at it. I, I, I won't mention the name of the country, but I went to a tropical country, let's say, um, where one year I, I gave them lots of specimens, hundreds of hours of work, you know, all, all nicely prepared and preserved. Then went back the next week, and the next year, and they just left them out in the rain. They'd all just rotted and just terrible. <laughs> Whereas if they'd been at Kew, they'd have been perfectly preserved for hundreds of years. Because that's the lovely thing. With these specimens, you can go back in time. I mean, Kew has specimens that are three, four hundred years old, and they're exactly the same. For my research on these Nepenthes, I spent weeks going through the Kew herbarium, and you just see these incredible specimens collected from like 1810, 1820, that are annotated by like C. Darwin, obviously Charles Darwin, and, and so forth. Just extraordinary historical, and in a sense, the documents, their records of, um, of, of, yeah, of research and, and exploration and discovery. Um, and they're incredibly important. People don't realize just how important, because these, these are the things that show what each species is. And if they're lost, our concepts of those species is likewise lost, as was the case in that plant, Nepenthes deaniana, I mentioned uh, in the prison. Um, so they're very, very, very important and, um, and very special. Yeah. Any other questions at all? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Which of the modern languages is the most useful? I mean, with uh, Spanish, you can talk in millions. That's so, very uh, true. What about Chinese? I mean, what's yes. the going recommendation? I mean, honestly, I, I, to be honest, I, I've been very fortunate um, to, to be... I speak German and Spanish, and so I've been very fortunate to... Yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Chinese, of course, the, um, the many languages of Chinese would be invaluable. Unfortunately... Right, yes. I, I unfortunately haven't done that much research in mainland China, so I'm afraid I, I don't really know to that extent. English, definitely. South America, obviously Spanish and Portuguese. Um, and, and French, of course, uh, as well, particularly across Africa. Um, many of the Southeast Asian um, herbariums and botanists, of course, speak English, and more and more so, of course, English um, is it, sort of the more, more, particularly in science, the more you know, universal it becomes. But, but honestly, I think... The more local languages you can learn, the better. And it's a tragedy, likewise, part of this loss of culture, that likewise it's a loss of languages. And fewer, fewer, fewer people, especially in this country, don't learn languages. And um, that's a tragedy. It's also out of respect to the, the places we go to. And it's amazing what just a little token of respect like that can, can do and pay dividends in working with colleagues and stuff. So, yeah, um, languages are very important. And I, I think you're absolutely right, Chinese would be many languages of Chinese mm -hmm. would be very important, definitely. Oh, no. <laughs> definitely. Oh. <laughs> cool. oh. How valuable is to make contact with colleagues in the, in the countries that you... Oh, totally invaluable. Often the case is that um, we as foreigners aren't allowed to collect any specimens. So as ridiculous it, as it might sound, we might go to an area, find a plant, but not actually be allowed to collect it. So, you know, we have a local partner that he is the one that is allowed to physically collect it and preserve it. And like I said, I really, really try and, and not, um, not, not infringe on any laws or, or, or you know, hurt any, any, any of the trust that's been um, bestowed in, in this. And so, of course, always basically do that. Um, but, but to answer your question, it's totally invaluable. First of all, getting the permits in the first place, physically collecting them and the connections to get those permits, specimens into the herbaria, um, whereby that makes the descriptions of the species valid. So it, it couldn't, you couldn't do it without it. Um, the days of, of the pith hat, pith hat um, clad uh, machete wearing 
um, you know, <laughs> Europeans going what ho and climbing through jungles and collecting everything they see and then coming back on a ship back to England. That, that's not really the case anymore. You, you, and, and it shouldn't be the case anymore. You, of course, it's correct and, and right to work with, with um, local partners. And also, for example, the transfer of knowledge and skills is a two-way process. So, um, so yeah, it, it is completely key, definitely, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. What's the climate like? Um, apart from being very wet, is it, does it get cold or yes. snow? Yes, I just nip back. Okay, here. Um, well, these plateaus themselves, so um, they're up to about 3,000 metres. There's never really been ice, uh, at least as far as we know in recorded history, on them. And the reason why we know that is because um, basically they're covered with these rock towers, these sandstone pinnacles that you saw earlier. And, of course, sandstone is permeable. If there had ever been ice on them, the freeze thaw would have just destroyed all those structures. So it, it, that's pretty compelling evidence that it's never been ice. In today's climate, and you of course always must remember climate changes, not just through man-made climate change today, but has always changed dramatically through time. But in today's climate at least, um, this, um, this, uh, it, it can get cold, like down to about three, four degrees, but it never, ever, ever, at least today, gets frosty or ice. Um, icy and, and cold, uh, that cold, <laughs> it's still cold, <laughs> um, but never ice. Um, so it can get down to three or four degrees or so. Um, um, it can, it's one of the wettest places in the world. It can rain every single day, in some cases for a week on end. And it has this extraordinary phenomenon, which is sheet lightning. So whereas normal lightning is a single flash and bang, this can be like multiple, bang, 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 all in a row. There's these huge tropical systems roll over these summits. So on these particular mountains, you must camp inside these huge caves. Well, they're more like outcrops, but anyway, they're called locally hotels. And um, <laughs> you can camp in those hotels um, away from the, the rolling storms. Um, I, mean, I do expeditions um, for people interested in these places to come along. And if anyone wants to come, I'm actually doing one in August to these plateaus. Um, and other ones to see Nepenthes and stuff. So if anyone wants to, to go on any of these trips, you, you can. Um, anyway, this particular plateaus, these particular ones, the Tepuis, yeah, are very interesting in that respect because they are the wettest places in the world. And it's that abundance of water that, that, that drives the ecosystem and cripples them and, um, and creates this extraordinary lost world of, of plants and animals. So, yeah, how, that's... How big are those plateaus? Well, each one is totally... There's a hundred of them. Um, yeah. Um, some of them can have a top the size of this room, literally, a spire, the top, the top of this room. This one is, from memory, about, I think, eight or nine kilometres that way, and about four, I think, about that way. But it's not so much size. Size has a different meaning here, because, like I said, I mean, it can take an entire day to, from get, to go from here to here, even though it might only be two or three kilometres. It's because of these ravines and these mazes of towering rocks that make you zigzag backwards and forwards. So um, distance is quite a strange concept here. Um, there was one talk that I was, one little story that I was going to put in, and I'll just very quickly recount it, just because um, I wanted to put it in, but I, f I feared we might not, not have had time, and I did go over a little bit, so I, I guess I, it's probably good that I didn't put it in. But anyway, now that I can cheat and put it in in the, the questions, that I'd like to mention it. Um, that on that big helicopter exhibition down to the, the Neblina Range, there's one really amazing mountain called Sierra Aretitiopi, which is called the, the House of the Parrots in the local language. It's basically a massive blade of granite. Most of these are sandstone. Certainly this one here is sandstone, Rima. But this particular one that I'm talking about now, Aretitiopi, was a massive, literally like a needle of, of, um, of uh, granite. I think it might have been a volcanic core or something like that, but whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. It's just this huge blade of, of um, rock, of granite that stands out hundreds, thousands, a thousand meters, something like that, above the lowland forests. And no one had, had ever landed on it. Um, people had only ever, I think there'd been one team that had abseiled up it. Um, it was still basically terra incognita. And um, when we did this epic helicopter trip, the, helicopter, the owner of the helicopter said to the pilot, don't, don't even try it, you, you can't. 
And the, the pilot was this very young, like, very cool, you know, Latino kind of guy who's only about 22 or, well, no, maybe a bit older, 24 or something like that, you know, who's smoking cigarettes all the time and had his, you know, he was like really like muscular and, you know, just running around all the time with all the girls and just one of those very showy offy sort of, you know, um, guys all the time. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, as we were flying down to Neblina, there was this huge towering needle of rock towering through the clouds. And he, he looked at us and said, we're, we're so doing it. Um, <laughs> and we were just like, really? <laughs> OK. And um, actually, I'm regretting not putting it in now. It's such a cool, um, cool story, because it's just so ridiculous. We, we actually, it was on the return journey from these plateaus, so after a week or two on these remote end of the world mountains. It was on the way back, and he had just come down from a, a community and brought with him like a, a roast chicken or some wonderful meat that we hadn't seen for a week or two. And um, he decided to, um, to land on this spire of rock and have this extraordinary photograph of, it, it's like this bouldered surface. And honestly, I'm not exaggerating, it really is about the surface of this summit. That's it. It was just, a, you know, 10 metres by 10 metres or something like that. It was just this tiny little summit area and it was a rounded, bold, granitic um, outcrop. And the helicopter was obviously landed at an angle. And... Um, <laughs> We didn't have satellite phones, and there was no way on earth you could climb down this. If the helicopter just slid off, I mean, we're, you're dead. There's no question. No one knew that we were there. There's no way you could ever get off of it. There's no way on earth. There's no one for hundreds of miles in any direction except rainforest. And, um, and it was just the most extraordinary lunch of my, my life. I remember we, we got out, sat, and got a photograph somehow. I mean, we put on a rock or something. Took a photo, and it was myself and two friends and the pilot. Um, and um, just having lunch on this tiny outcrop, a thousand meters above the rainforest, with the helicopter at an angle about to slip off. Um, and just extraordinary uh, um, moment, a flash. And I say it's so funny how that's, that was like my first real trip there, which was kind of the, the biggest one I ever did as well. And, um, and it, where we descended off the mountain and had to circle down to lose altitude, going round and round and round this towering pinnacle. And, I'll never forget looking through the perspex dome of the helicopter and uh, a flock of macaws, I think they were scarlet macaws, I don't really know, but anyway, huge macaws, uh, flew, just flew just right over the helicopter and um, just then, we, then we continued out over the rainforest. Um, so yeah, these plateaus, this is really the exciting area. There's so much still down there to be explored and discovered and who knows what's <coughs> out there. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very, very, very interesting places. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Is there anything alive on top of that? Yes, there's actually quite a surprising lot. <laughs> there's this um, extraordinary... Oh, how can I go back all the way? Oh, I'll just keep clicking it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this extraordinary paradox by, whereby, because of the abundance of water, no one species becomes dominant. And the consequence of that is that um, you, get, um, you get relatively little plant life. However the pockets of plant life that you do get are incredibly diverse. So most of the landscape actually consists of bare rock, of, of empty landscapes. But in that bizarre empty landscape, you get these little islands of vegetation. And in those islands, you get the most extraordinary um, concentrated pockets of life from plants and animals living on rock, in water, on land, on other, other plants as epiphytes. So in these tiny, tiny little, um, oh, I'm not sure if I've got any photos that really demonstrate this. Anyway, in, in, in these summer environments, you get these incredibly diverse habitats um, with hundreds of species in some cases growing in an area the size of this table, um, which is incredibly diverse. And I'm not quite sure if I've got something to convey it. Um, well, I guess the best thing I've got here is here this landscape. So it's actually mostly naked stone, mm -hmm. naked rock. But in those areas, you get these little pockets. Mm -hmm. And when you start rooting around, there are these miniature worlds. And because it's, it's such a barren, extreme habitat, things can be so localized, like that sundew that I found. Um, like, oh, here, actually, that's a better one. Here, so here, you can see there's pools of water, just little margins of vegetation. But if you look at each of those hummocks, there can literally be like 50 species in there. Um, often small things, 
but things that have adapted in extraordinary and wonderful ways um, that, that, that often, yeah, often people just no one's properly studied and no one's um, really researched. And certainly for my carnivorous plants, that was the case for these in, these, in these bizarre pockets. And here, of course, like I said at the start, there's this other dimension as well. It, they are, in a sense, lost worlds in time, in the sense that they've been, they have been isolated through time. These are uplifted Precambrian sandstone. Um, they were uplifted about 65 million years ago as Africa and South America split apart. And it, it's, not, it's not really, an, you can't really just say that basically it's ancient life preserved there. It's not that simple. Things have got up there and migrated down and exchanged many times. But nevertheless, it is true to say that there's one of the greatest concentrations of relic species, ancient living fossils, that, um, that occur anywhere around the world. And that really is true. Things from giant wetters that are more <coughs> closely related to things in New Zealand, or, or those toads, or lots of ferns that are basically unchanged through time. And, and um, hundreds of other examples that and I can only start to, uh, to list. Um, so they're very, very extraordinary places. The birds visit oh. them. Yes, and some are migratory. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, don't worry. Um, and they've got some very strange birds. Oh, I don't have any photos. I'd happily do a, another talk on these, pla on these um, plateaus. Um, there's some very strange birds, like Stenocornis, the oil bird. Sorry, I didn't quite pronounce that right, but anyway. The, the oil bird, the only bird in the world with a form of echolocation, like bats. Um, other birds are migratory. These are important stop-off points for hummingbirds and, uh, and, and other, other species. There's even raptors, birds of prey up here as well. Um, so yeah, there, there are, and that's what I was meaning. Like, it's not it's not quite as simple as just to say they're they're lost worlds that have never been touched since the time of the dinosaurs, because it's not true. Birds and animals exchange, you know, between them. But but nevertheless, they really are pockets, islands in in, in the land. Yeah, it's very special. Yeah. Yes. That was in New Guinea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was in the McClure Gulf. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, that, that's the lovely thing about searching for plants. Because like I said at the start, I actually love... I'm a naturalist, I'm not a botanist. I love all things natural. Um, animals, plants, and of course, archaeology as well, just as much. And um, those particular ones were quite cool because we had to find a species called Nepenthes trubiana. Here, um, Nepenthes trubiana, this species that had only ever been seen once or twice. And it was known to grow in this gulf on New Guinea called the McClure Gulf. And all that was really known is that it grew over these cliffs. And so we had to just basically get some canoes and um, go out along those cliff faces and see if we could see it. And um, a friend of mine actually had, uh, so we cheated a bit, a friend of mine had actually seen it already, so we knew it was there. But anyway, um, along the cliffs, there are these many, 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 many sites of these extraordinary, um, extraordinary um, ancient um, rock paintings. Um, and as far as I know, I mean, I don't think all of them have even been charted to this day. There's loads of them. And they're very interesting because they're different sizes. Like the Papuans, who live, who live obviously in Papua today, um, Tommy, the, the, the fellow that I was with, put his hand next to them, and it was completely, I think it was much smaller so they might have been made by, there are lots of traders from Makassar and Sulawesi and, and even different ethnic groups that, that migrated backwards and forwards between um, New Guinea and Australia. So who knows how old they are? And there's very, I mean, obviously there's like an octopus there and there's lots of extraordinary shapes and colours and, and sizes. And, you know, this is the thing, this was saying earlier about this ore. There's just so much to see and we forget this today. It's even anywhere, in England just as much as New Guinea. There's so much, and, um, and you could spend a lifetime just in that one place. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing. Cool. Thank you. I think that was absolutely fantastic. I hope you join me again. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute honour to be at the Royal Horticultural Society, uh, an illustrious institution I've always loved. Um, so thank you very, very much for having me. And, coming to my talk. <laughs> Thanks. Thank